You find yourself in a forest and your mission is to find a plot for where you start building a home. And from that home, you will go on to adventures to explore the world. And this is the, the core of what you're doing as a player. But not only are you building that home yourself, you will actually find other players to build a whole village and do the adventures together and improve the, the, qual like the quality of life for your clan to be able to do all of this in, in a, this social fashion and really cooperate with other players rather than doing it alone. And, and seeing other people building similar villages and cities and being able to go to them and trade and do all the social interaction you ever imagined you would be able to do the game. So with the lore, we have wanted to create something that is fairly like deep and rich and grounded in reality, but something that is actually not a direct copy of like any of the history. Um, so there's going to be, there's multiple types of ruins, there's the, the dungeons, um, and, and you will be able to find snippets of the lore from the eras when these were created um, in the game itself. And, and part of the like, lore and mystery is also part of the, in, in the gameplay itself, so you will be able to like, find and examine things and actually then find snippets that help you find other places and make items in the game itself. And the, the area of the game that you will be able to play when the game launches is what you're calling it Gallia, and it's very similar to the areas of the world in, in southern France. Uh, with the influences from the Nordics where we're from. The development team were mostly Europeans. And obviously, we are living in, in Europe where there's a lot of culture and lots of historical influences around us. So we're here in this 14th century castle um, shooting this. And actually, I've been coming here multiple times and like seeing the evolution and history of Europe is obviously had a massive influence in how we've made the game, where all the items, like all of the nature, is something we actually seen in Europe. And so we want to reflect this uh, very medieval feel in the game. With building the ideal medieval world or medieval, fantastical medieval world, it's inspired by real world. Um, the first region we are uh, working with now is uh, inspired by France. Uh, we call the region Gallia. And, uh, and at the time, maybe 13th century, this is a very central point of Europe. So we're very much um, using the, uh, the forests and the, the, the natural elements of southern France or France or the Pyrenees uh, currently. And this means that, you know, the, the flora is uh, authentic in the sense of the combination of, of flowers and, uh, and wildlife matches. Here we have thousands of years of lore building, which have in, you know, in, in folklore and mythologies and, you know, and, and religions, and we, we built it straight into the game. If you find something in the game, it is highly likely that this thing actually exists in the real world, and you can read about it on, on Wikipedia. As an example, the legend of the basilisk, all right? How do you defeat the basilisk? We're not gonna tell you, but there are a lot of folklore about, you know, how the basilisk is defeated. The way we're thinking about the creatures is the um, we talk about the subjective reality of people living in the Middle Ages. So instead of trying to mimic Middle Ages as they were, we're thinking about what are the, what were the things that people believed in the era, and and all of that is real. So so the deeper you start to adventure in the world from the safety of your home, the more fantastical things will become. The the more dangerous the creatures are, you will be experiencing. And we're really again like trying to draw from the lore of the Middle Ages. So if you've seen creatures that were believed to exist in the Middle Ages, you're likely to meet at least some of them in the game itself. Same with the costumes. Uh, we have been researching uh, medieval costumes from multiple areas and we're kind of focusing on the 12th to the 15th century. And uh, we're using the same colors, we're using the, the dye recipes from, from that era. Um, but at the same time, it is kind of a cinematic reality. So the armors are, you know, beautifully engraved and it is, you know, very beautiful things based on real world items. Because there's an amazing amount of stuff the, in the real world which is so incredibly well made and beautiful from these times. And the gear that you're using, we don't have like deep fantasy gear with like fancy spikes all over the armor as opposed to actually wanting to make something that feels very grounded and real even if we made something that is like look extremely beautiful like a lot more intricate than people would have had in the Middle Ages. So we want to have this level of fantasy and and, and um, kind of like just awesomeness <laughs> to everything we're putting into the game. 
um, while it all being very grounded in kind of the what we've seen ourselves in what Europe is and like what the history of Europe has been. And we feel that there's a lost opportunity in a lot of uh, fantasy games which kind of invent their own visual styles out of nowhere. And this kind of grounds everything together and ties it together in a very meaningful uh, package. So what we're building is we're calling it the social sandbox. We're putting the least amount of barriers to entry on, on how you can actually interact with the other players. Uh, where most MMOs actually put a lot of blocks in how you can cooperate with the other players, and we're fundamentally different. So from the first minute when you start playing the game, you will be able to do everything you imagine with the other players. So you can trade, other people can actually help you. You can literally go onto a like dungeon raid from the very beginning of like you're starting the journey in the in the game should you find people who actually help you to do that. What we want to create an environment that actually really incentivizes people to play the game the way they like. And for some, actually like just going out to the wood and like cutting down the forest is something that gives you a sense of achievement because you know the coal that you're helping to produce actually is valuable for the guild. Some people will absolutely prefer to just go to the dungeons. They couldn't care less about the coal production, but these players will still depend on each other where there's valuables to bring from the dungeon, there's valuables to bring from the forest, and even the PvP players, they will be able to produce items that are only available through the PvP, but they will depend on the other players as well. So if you want to help somebody give them items or like build something together, we always actually like really try to incentivize device and like never put anything that prevents people from doing that. And the things we want to achieve with this is things like when a new player signs up, rather than them being something that for the experienced people, it being very difficult to play with that new player. We actually want that new player to be a very valuable commodity to the, the existing old guilds. So you actually want to get the new people into the guild because they can help you immediately. Um, so for example, crafting the armors, you obviously need a lot of coal to be able to do the blacksmithing. And a new player can just like immediately after signing up, you can get them to your home, give them the ax, show the cut, how to cut down the tree, how to bring the wood to a kiln, and that's immediately valuable for the guild as something that the new player can do. And you will need to continue to do this even after you've been playing the game for a very long time. Pax Day is very much about focusing on the player himself. So uh, the, the hero's journey of it, each individual player it's very much up to him or her, you know, what, what choices he or she makes uh, through the game. And more so than being an individual's hero's journey, it's also the journey of, you know, creating civilizations within the game. So you must start by building your homestead, join up with a few people and you form, you know, a nucleus of a village, which then grows into a town and even a city. And then you can, you know, build communal buildings like, you know, market squares, you can build churches, you know, you can build the blacksmithy guild houses, and then you can join up with other cities, you can form baronies, and you, you basically build civilizations with, within the game. And at the highest end, you're building kingdoms. And everything is focused on the, the player, both in cooperation, uh, competition, and conflict, because we feel that's really where the magic lies in, in letting many, many people uh, play together, rather than having everybody playing their own, you know, individual story. Historically, end games defined as the like your first level up, and once you the level cap, the end game begins, and you start, for example, like grinding for gear. Essentially, in Pax Day, you start at the end, end game. Like we don't have a level progression. Um, there are like means of progressing, but we what we've created is an environment where you kind of get to choose the like how to play the game in a manner of like flexibility that you typically find only in the end game, and and the. And the end game style elements that you maybe would find is like once you've been like exploring the world is there's a deep uh, level of um, just basically politics that you can involve in because we have the communities building. Somebody's going to need to lead the communities uh, with PvP. You need to rally your troops to actually go and do things. Um, and and the and you will be able to do things like corner the market in how like people are able to get resources and who are the best crafters. So there's this deep layer of social interaction that we're building into the game and all of the kind of things where you can be like a master of in the real world, you kind of can master in, in Pax Day. All of our systems tend to focus on this, not only in like uh, clan tools or, or how, they, how the player economy is run, but also creating you know, positions, of, positions of power within the feudal system and within the organizations in the game. So this is a game where you build civilization from the ground up 
with all the positions of power involved in feudal feudal system, and we find that incredibly exciting. And this means that you don't start as a level one knight; you become the knight. You don't start as the leader of the guild of blacksmiths; you become it. And uh, there is only one pope. So one of the things we find so compelling with the medieval times is that nobody really knows the extent of knowledge. Everybody's looking for, you know, the, the Holy Grail or the Philosopher's Stone. And because so much knowledge has been lost, uh, and technology has been lost, you know, in the dark Middle Ages, people are always on this quest of finding, rediscovering this, you know, old magic or... And there's something we want to recreate uh, in the world. And you will find these mysterious uh, things or parchments or paper. and. And you can actually, you know. This is where we belong. Exploring this vast and wondrous world. Its treasures call out to be discovered. Its ancient secrets beckon us ever deeper into the unknown. The further we journey from the safety of the light, the greater the rewards and the dangers. This world, it is for us. Here, together, we can build ourselves a home.